Thank you, Dan, for the introduction. Thanks for this invitation. It's great to be here. This is actually my first time at UCLA. I'm very delighted to be here. Um, so I'll be talking about some of, uh, some of this work on religion and cooperation and conflict that I've been doing uh, with a group of colleagues. Um, and uh, I'm just going to present you some highlights of this research program. So it's not going to be completely exhaustive, but feel free to ask me questions if there are, there are gaps in, in what I'm saying. And then we can perhaps uh, fill it in uh, th throughout discussion. I'll start with a uh, little bit about the fact that the topic of religion itself has been a neglected topic in the evolutionary st studies of human behavior and cognitive science. So uh, Paul Broom has said, for example, that, you know, it, it, speaking about psychologists in this case, he said, religion is like sex to a Victorian or dreams to a behaviorist, an awkward and embarrassing phenomenon best not talked about. A little bit like this guy who you know, says, I want to talk about my religion, and nobody wants to talk to him. Bob McCollin, Harvey Whitehouse, uh, as with so many contemporary intellectuals, cognitive scientists, and until quite recently, have mostly found topics like religion to be an embarrassment. No topic, even sex, death, taxes, or terrorism, can elicit any more quirky, unpredictable responses from intellectuals than religion. David Sloan Wilson, and this is something that actually he actually has verified by looking up. More scientific articles have been published about the evolution of one species of fish, the guppy, than about the evolution of religion. The guppy is that fish that you see in a lot of aquariums around the world. So uh, f there are interesting reasons for this, that, you know, that, uh, w for why religion has been a neglected topic. There has been a shift. There is a bit more coverage of this topic, given its uh, importance in the world. But still, it's not on the radar of most psychologists, uh, unlike anthropologists who have had a long tradition of studying religion. OK, I'll, uh, I'll start my... Uh, my uh, talk with uh, two puzzles that, that is sort of the starting point of what I want to talk about. And one is the, the puzzle of large-scale cooperation. And the other one that I'll talk about is the puzzle of uh, the non-randomness of distribution of religious traditions. So um, the puzzle of large-scale cooperation is something that's well known in, 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 for those people who study uh, human evolution. And that's the, the fact that unlike most other species, in fact, probably pretty much any other species, and unlike uh, our previous history, uh, before 10,000 years ago, as, as foragers, uh, the vast majority of human beings l live in very large-scale societies. We live in communities of complete strangers. And what's puzzling about this, of course, is that uh, the usual well-known mechanisms of, of, uh, of ev ev evolutionarily well-understood mechanisms of cooperation don't, don't really work when people are interacting with complete strangers. So, uh, kin altruism requires some kind of genetic relatedness. Reciprocal altruism requires repeated interactions over time with the same people to develop reputation-driven um, cooperation. Uh, neither of them actually work in large cooperative groups. Uh, so we need additional mechanisms to, 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 get, to, to get at what's going on. And of course, there are many things going on, uh, markets, institutions, traditions, division of labor. And uh, my claim in this, in this uh, program of research is that one of these mechanisms might, could be some variants of religious beliefs and behaviors that could have also stabilized cooperation in large groups. So the idea is not that these uh, variants of religions are the only way to stabilize religious co cooperation uh, in large scale. It's just one of many mechanisms. The other puzzle that I would like to introduce is, that, is the puzzle that uh, the religious diversity or theodiversity is non-randomly distributed. So if you actually look at the distribution of religious traditions and religious beliefs in the world, you see that uh, a few traditions account for the overwhelming majority of believers in the world. So Christians, you know, and, and again, here we're taking a very large group, of course, and lumping them together, but this is a... This is a there are many traditions within these traditions, but that's part of how cultural evolution works. Christians, Muslim, Hindus, and then you have the non-believers. And combined, you basically account for 95% of the world. Uh, in, it's another way of saying that folk religions, local folk religions, are a tiny percentage of the world, right? So how did this happen is an interesting question. And one clue uh, about this comes uh, from uh, this uh, famous archaeological site in south uh, central Turkey, Gopekli Tepe, that has intrigued archaeologists for, for decades. So this is the world's oldest known uh, religious temple. 
It's all, far older, older than the pyramids, far, far older than the Stonehenge. I believe it's about 11,500 years old. And what's really remarkable is that basically that's a time when people were foragers, right? So there's no evidence of agriculture that have been found in this, uh, on this site. Yet you see quite clear evidence of some degree of uh, uh, interaction among strangers. So, th so th there's some evidence of uh, collective worship of certain kinds of deities, although it's unclear what these deities were. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a clear evidence of collaboration that would have been required to produce this kind of a site. And there is evidence that people from all over Anatolia uh, probably interacted here in this site um, from evidence of, of uh, tools and stone remains. So this is an interesting site because uh, it kind of flips the, uh, the old argument and it's had the old argument being that uh, organized religion arose out of uh, settled uh, agriculture. So this site says, well, if that's true, how come we're not finding agriculture here? So perhaps it's, it, it raises the possibility that maybe some f uh, forms of organized religion occurred before settled agriculture happened, at least in some places in the world, like in this case, Anatolia. In which case, it raises, it raises the question of whether or not religion and large-scale cooperation are connected, uh, not, just, uh, not just as a byproduct of agriculture and uh, settled existence, but also as a possible, uh, one, of the, one of the possible causes. So this brings me to the question of uh, the cultural spread of religions and, uh, that which we, and the fact that the spread of religions is, again, very non-random. Here is an example from the Mormon church. Uh, which keeps very uh, meticulous records of their membership. And here you can see the remarkable spread of the Mormon church in, the, in just 170 years, right? Whether or not you look in terms of m number of members in the world, uh, you look at number of missions, number of countries that, they, that, that the, the church has settled, you see this dramatic increase, right? So this is one of the interesting things I think that we need to explain about religions, not just the recurrent features of religions that we see around the world, which is a very important project that uh, evolutionary and cultural scientists of religion have been doing, but also understanding why is that some variants of religion seem to spread uh, at the expense of other variants. Why is it that the Pentecostal church is the fastest growing religious tradition in the world today, along with Mormonism, but not other traditions like um, Unitarianism, for example, in the case of religion. So the idea that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elaborate on uh, is, is basically the idea that maybe certain variants of beliefs, rituals, and commitments, we, we call these pro-social religions, but you can call them anything you want. The label is not that important, although the idea is that maybe some variants of beliefs and rituals and commitments that arose out of, out of the way that our brains basically produce beliefs might have promoted... Uh, cooperation at a large scale with strangers. So the idea that I'm going to focus on here would be that maybe um, one example that we think is important is belief in moralizing gods. So if people in some places think of their gods as moralizing, uh, omniscient, and willingness, willing to punish norm violations might have encouraged people to interact with strangers in a way that enforces these norms which have led, would have led to an expansion of cooperation, which would have led to the um, expansion of these groups at the expense of other groups in intergroup competition, which have led to, uh, so this is a basically autocatalytic account, which would have led to the further expansion of these beliefs and commitments and rituals. So the idea is that uh, you start, we're starting with a cognitive byproduct account of, uh, of uh, religious beliefs and behaviors. Uh, so it's not an, uh, this is not an argument that uh, re religion is an adaptation in evolved psychology to, to, uh, to, uh, for cooperation, but the idea is that f there are other reasons why religious beliefs are intuitive, religious practices and rituals can be, can be accounted for in terms of a byproduct account, but once you have a byproduct, once these beliefs and practices are intuitive and compelling, then some variants of it might spread at the exp expense of other variants um, and that would account for the, what the changes we see in the last 10,000 years. So, it, so basically that's a cultural evolution account combined with a cognitive byproduct account. This, uh, this account is different from other accounts that are already out there, and we can talk about these differences, if you like, uh, over the, as, I'm, as I'm describing some of this research. So there's a cognitive byproduct account, 
that says, no, there is no effect of religion on any other uh, 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 and, and behavior. So it's just a just byproduct account all the way. So this is different from our account in the sense that we think that you can start with a byproduct account, but you can still add downstream effects of religion on behavior. Um, in this case, you know, cooperation with strangers and other things. Uh, whereas this account says there is no effect of religion on other things. There is a supernatural punishment hypothesis uh, also that, 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 that makes very similar predictions as uh, our account, although there are some differences. And this account is that supernatural punishment is, is, is more of an error management account where uh, it's part of our evil psychology, in which case you'd expect that uh, these, uh, these effects should be universal. Whereas in our account, we're looking at the cultural variability of these. Of, so, so we're looking at to see if um, across cultures, in groups where gods are punishing, moralizing, and omniscient, are going to produce more uh, stranger to stranger cooperation. But in places where these gods are not moralizing and punishing and omniscient, you shouldn't expect these effects. Whereas in the supernatural uh, punishment account, this is a, if I understand it correctly, it's, it's a universal account. It should happen everywhere. Finally, there's a constant signaling or constant commitment account of religion that focuses more on rituals. So I won't talk too much about rituals in, in here, but we think that rituals are also an extremely important element of these religions. And costly signaling could be part of the package. So, uh, so it's not incompatible with what I'm saying, but it's a different account. Okay. So I have a book where I, this is kind of laid out in some detail, but it's 300 pages. You might want to not want to read it. We have another paper that came out uh, two years ago. It's a BBS paper. It's very long, so you might want, you may or may not want to read it. Uh, but a lot of, there's a lot of detail there. There's also commentary and response to commentary, which could be interesting. But if you want a five-minute account, there is a rap song <laughs> by a Canadian, uh, by a Canadian um, rapper named Baba Brinkman. And the way he describes uh, his work is, he says, it's Canadian hip hop with an intellectual bent nothing but sexy beats and sumptuous brain food. So, and he does talk about the, uh, this, this, to some extent, this account um, in, in, a, in a song format. Okay, so there are two things that, uh, that have been on, on, on my mind in, in, in embarking on this project uh, that I'll, I'll briefly describe to you as, a, as we move along. One is the fact that a lot of psychology, so this is coming from my own perspective in psychology, is, uh, is, is weird in the sense that we typically study weird people, people who are um, in the West, uh, typically American, typically middle class, a lot of them are students. And, and of course it becomes very quickly obvious, especially if you're in anthropology or other fields, that you can't really study these, the questions that I want to study in this population. So we need to collect cross-cultural data where there's quite a bit of variability on these variables uh, the, the, how people mentally represent their gods, uh, how much people cooperate with strangers. You can't study it in, 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 in a Western culture because Western cultures have maxed out on many of these variables. So a lot of the studies that I want to show you are, in fact, uh, cross-cultural studies. The other thing that is a more recent concern, so, so when I, you know, ever since I was a student, I was always, I always worried about psychology, my field, that we were... Um, oversampling from a very tiny slice of uh, human diversity, and that's going to co cause a lot of problems. Uh, I didn't realize that there was another problem lurking in how we were doing things, which was that we, can, we couldn't even replicate a lot of our own findings within the same culture, within the same samples. So that's, the repli that, that's replicate, right? That's the replicability crisis in psychology. So, um, so in recent years, we've sort of moved our research to, to be more uh, responsive to this problem. And so we make efforts to increase statistical power. Uh, we've been pre-registering our findings, uh, our, our hypothesis, excuse me. Um, we, we have a commitment to share data uh, and, and, uh, and our methods and our analytical choices. And I think another uh, problem that, that is, that is uh, key to the understanding the replicability crisis is poor theorizing. So oftentimes, um, if theories are not clear in articulating what are the limitations of a finding, then if you don't understand that, then uh, we're just replicating things without understanding what are the limitations. We might not replicate things because we, we just don't understand 
where the boundaries are. So I think that's another important consideration. And I think a lot of, a lot of these uh, changes have to happen in a context of slowing down a little bit to do things better, although that's a difficult problem to solve. Uh, but I think I've become mindful that uh, I think sometimes we're going too fast uh, and we need to slow down to take into account all these, all these considerations. Okay, I'll start with uh, one. Uh, so, so how do we get to this question of uh, understanding whether or not uh, pro-social religious beliefs and behaviors co-evolved with large-scale cooperation? Uh, and so you can make a number of predictions from that. Uh, hypothesis. One is that you should expect across cultures in the ethnographic record big gods, moralizing, omniscient um, and interventionist gods should be more likely in places where um, where there's more, uh, where group size is larger and there's more social complexity. And there have been many studies that have found that. So that that's confirms the hypothesis. Um, so uh, here is one uh, by Rosen Raymond. Uh, so this is from the um, uh, standard cross-cultural sample. As you can see, as the, uh, on the y-axis, you have basically the likelihood of, 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 of culture having a moralizing God. Um, and on the y-axis is, is jurisdictional hierarchy from communities that don't have any social complexity or very little social complexity to large states, like the typical nation state. And you can see that there is a very strong uh, correlation. And uh, this, uh, you get this controlling for some obvious things you want to control for. Uh, so inequality, missionary activity, population density. Uh, controlling for region is important because of um, Galton's problem. Many of these uh, beliefs spread geographically, so you want to control for that. Um, there are other studies like this. One, uh, one uh, another interesting study that was uh, done recently by Botero and colleagues found also that uh, there are other variables that predict the likelihood of having moralizing gods. Um, and uh, one of them is harsher ecologies. So places where the ecology is harsher, uh, you are more likely to get moralizing gods con controlled for uh, the other variables. Uh, social complexity also turns out to be a strong independent predictor. So more complex, socially complex hierarchical societies are more likely to have big gods. And in all these cases, you can make the case the argument that um, uh, these are situations where collective action is extremely important. So, so cultural solutions, like uh, in this case coming out of religious beliefs, uh, can stabilize large scale cooperation. It also could be the other way around, right? It could be that in places that are larger, more socially complex, harsher, people might imagine gods that are power, more powerful, stronger, uh, harsher, etc. So, this is just a correlational finding. It doesn't tell us about causality, it's, but it's consistent with the argument I presented. Um, so, a few years ago, I, uh, we were, uh, Azim Sharif and I were, uh, int uh, were uh, thinking along these lines and wanted to, as a first step, see if we can uh, experimentally fi find any evidence that thinking about a moralizing God would increase uh, uh, cooperation. So we did these studies where we primed people with uh, r religious concepts and then um, and then we had people play the dictator game in an anonymous context, and we found effects consistent with this idea. So people were more likely to be generous in an anonymous dictator, one-shot dictator game, when they were primed with religious concepts um, than when they weren't. We also found evidence that when uh, people were primed with secular concepts, secular institution concepts, they also became more generous, consistent with the idea that secular institutions can also do, this, you know, do the same job. And then soon afterwards, Joe Henrik and his colleagues um, published this paper where they found, uh, they looked at, uh, they had uh, people play uh, economic games in different cultures varying on, on, uh, on a variety of interesting dimensions. And they found two really interesting effects on, on, um, on prosociality in, dic in dictator games, ultimatum games, and I think it was third party punishment games. And uh, the two effects were market, market integration and religion. And so that really kind of was an interesting complement to what we were doing. Um, so here the finding is that uh, people were more generous with a comp with, with a, in an anonymous context with a potential stranger if they belong to a world religion. So the variable was quite crude. Uh, so it was just a question of like, 
was was this person did this person say that they they uh, were Christian or Muslim I think that was that was uh, these were two, two options in terms of world religion uh, and that actually predicted um, more prosocial behavior controlling for other variables market integ integration and group size being very important ones and here is an interesting example where uh, I think the hypothesis so the 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 Cognitive byproduct hypothesis says there is no effect of religion; it's just a reflection of scale. Uh, shouldn't you shouldn't get this effect, right? If it if it's just a reflection, then controlling for group size, market integration should eliminate the effect. It didn't. So that was kind of interesting. So then, um, Joe Henrik and I, and and along with Ben Porziki, who was our postdoc at the time, decided to sort of combine these efforts and. Um, do a more fine-grained analysis of, of these beliefs across cultures, so collect uh, economic game data, but also uh, do detailed, rich ethnographic interviews to get at people's mental representations of their gods. And so the key variable here we were interested in was how much people thought that their gods were punishing or rewarding. We also measured um, how much people thought their gods were omniscient, how much they knew, and how much they cared about human morality. Uh, again, if you think about our culture here, the typical study of psychologists, there's, no vari there's not much variability. There's a little bit of variability, but not a lot. But if you go across the world, uh, you can get a quite a bit of variability on this, which allows us to test this hypothesis. So, uh, in our, so we, we did this study in two different waves. I'll show you some results from wave one. Ra wave two data just came in, so I'll verbally describe it to you. Uh, but let's start with wave one. So we had um, eight different field sites, close to just under 600 participants, uh, although we had uh, lots of trials uh, in this particular game called the random allocation game that some of you are familiar with. So we had almost 35,000 trials, uh, which gave us enough statistical power to test at this, to get at this question. So the question was, is it the case that just going beyond uh, having a re world religion or not having a world religion, which is very crude, as I said, uh, is it the case that the more people think of their gods as moralizing, punishing, and um, omniscient, the more likely they would be more pro-social with a stranger who is a co-religionist? That's the specific hypothesis here. Okay? So someone you've never met before, uh, you, don't interact, you have never interacted before, but you know that they're of the same religion as you are. Okay? We also looked at the so we'll, uh, effect of local belief in local gods that have local concerns, not global concerns. So in the random allocation game, we had the, a few variants of this game. Uh, in this game, people play, the, play this game where they're, they're given two cups, they're given a die, they roll the die, and then, depend, and then they mentally decide, uh, depending on what the, the die's outcome is, they put uh, a, a coins in one cup or the other. In, so in one version of the game was playing uh, the game with the self as being one cup and uh, a distal, distant core religionist, someone, a stranger you've never met before who would have the same religion as you are. So for example, in one field site was in the Tuva Republic in, in southern Siberia, in, in Russia. And people there have a mix of religious beliefs, of Buddhist, Buddhist beliefs and also local animistic beliefs. So in this case, the, the, it would be basically you play this game with, you can give money to yourself or you can give money to a, another Buddhist who lives in a different village you've never met before. Uh, another version of the game was, uh, you, the one cup was a local person in your village or uh, a distant core religion in a different village you've never met before. So you, you basically, you, you roll the die 30, 30 times and the being an outcome of the die, you put the, the, uh, the, the coin in one cup or the other cup. Okay? So, from just a, so basically, this is a, a, a rule-following game. And it allows us to see if people are going to be uh, biased towards themselves or their own community, or they will be willing to favor or be unbiased uh, in relation to distant core religionists. If people are completely unbiased and they're just following, uh, you know, probabilities, that as you play this game over and over again, it should approximate chance. Should the distribution should be basically half and half, right? It should be 15 in one cup and 15 in another cup. So, th to the extent that there's deviation from 
uh, from chance, we, we, we could basically, that gives us a measure of uh, norm violations in favor of the self or the in-group or the distant correligionist. And then we basically tried to see if we can predict this, the, the, the deviations over time. There was variability in how much people deviated from chance. Uh, the amount of deviation was not huge, so we had a narrow window we, that we could work, work with. Although there's, there was variability across groups on this. And then we, we looked at, to that, to that extent, people thought that their gods were, were willing to punish, how much they knew. Uh, we also, as I said, we looked at the local gods. That was, in a sense, it was a control, right? And we found that moralistic god punishment and omniscience did have the expected effects, controlling for a number of things, other variables, but local gods didn't have any effect. So it's not just in general belief in any god that does this, that produces this effect. It's a particular kind of god that's moralizing and, and um, uh, so that's a distinction here, the local versus the, um, the other god. The one big distinction is that the, the one is a moralistic, moralist, moralistic god, excuse me, the local god is not so much moralistic. And then more punishing and more omniscient moralistic gods um, produced more, um, more allocations to the distant correligionist. One interesting uh, comment about methodology here is that we didn't want to use any deception, so we actually allocated the coins exactly the way that the participants said. So we had this dilemma where people allocated coins to a distant correligionist. So we have to now take the money and then take it to, to, to a distant village and then distribute it. So researchers actually went to a different village and then stopped people on the street and said, hey, uh, are you Buddhist? And instead of said that, we gave them money. They were like, very pleasantly surprised. It was good news for them. But we had to do it that way because we said we will do it that way. Okay. Um, you can see also there were some other effects. Material insecurity was, wasn't significant here. In, a, in previous studies, it was significant, but so we controlled for it. Number of children had, a, had a, some effect on, on their allocations in the opposite direction. Okay. Uh, so... Oh, let me tell you a little bit about our follow-up. So we just got now data uh, in, a, in a second wave of data on this, and we expanded our, our sample from eight cultures to 15 cultures. Our sample size is now over 2,000 people. We added a few things in this second wave of data. I, I, I'm not going to show it to you because we're still, we're still writing this up, so it's not ready yet to show. But essentially what we found was, um, well, here's what we did. We, we expanded this, the number of sites to 15, we added a dictator game to the, to the random allocation game. And we also looked at uh, how people played this game with an outgroup member. And we let each field researcher define um, what an outgroup member was in their own culture, which was not easy. It was a bit complicated because there are different ways to think about this. Um, because we're also interested in um, the, the, the question of parochiality, how much of these effects are, are bounded by the in-group. Uh, and there are different ways to think about this. So, uh, for, and so things get complicated really quickly. For example, you might think that uh, these effects should be parochial, meaning that if you're a Buddhist, you should be pro with a Buddhist, but not necessarily with a Christian, or vice versa. And that's probably true in a lot of places. But there are some interesting complications. So, for example, in some religions that are proselytizing, a potential outgroup member is a potential convert. So, if there is proselytizing potential, you might expect that um, people might be prosocial even with outgroup members. It's really hard to tell. So, we, we also added an, uh, added an in outgroup cup, uh, cup in the ca case of the rag or an outgroup uh, target in the case of the dictator game. Briefly, um, the results largely replicated with the dictator game. So the distant correligionist effect replicated with the dictator game. Um, the rag also replicated with an expanded sample. With the outgroup member, uh, the outgroup condition, we got huge variability across fields. There was no general pattern. So in some places, people seem to be more pro-social with, with, with the religious outgroup. In, in some cases, people became less pro-social. In some field sites, there was no difference. So we're still trying to figure out what's going on. That's a really interesting question. If you're interested in religion and conflict and, and group boundaries, uh, but we don't have a clear handle on this question yet. I'll be very curious to hear your thoughts on this. 
OK, so going back to the priming stuff, uh, another effort has been to sort of, uh, because this is important also because it gives us some uh, evidence of, of uh, the causal direction, right? So uh, if it is the case that these religious beliefs, these variants of these religious beliefs um, have effects on uh, cooperation, then we should be able to uh, find experimental evidence for these kinds of causal arrows. So uh, in a recent effort, um, now that there has been a, quite a bit of uh, studies doing uh, inducing religious thinking experimentally, uh, overwhelmingly, of course, in, in uh, weird samples, uh, but not exclusively, we, uh, we did a meta-analysis. And so um, the meta-analysis, actually, we did a series of meta-analyses. I'll just show you one of them. Uh, the overall meta-analysis was quite large, but focusing on only pro-social behaviors as the outcome in this, in this slide, uh, we, did, we do get an overall effect of religious priming on, uh, on, um, on pro-social behavior. This is not self-reports. This is actual pro-social behavior in, typically in things like economic games. Um, however, one interesting outcome of this meta-analysis was that the effect was not significant for non-believers. So when we uh, separated samples by whether or not uh, the participants were believers or not believers, the effect was robust for believers but not for non-believers. This was interesting for us to see because in, when we were looking at studies, uh, we always typically found inconsistent effects with non-believers. But in, in the meta-analysis, it just was not significant to non-believers. This effect was robust when we adjusted for at least one method of, of adjusting for the file drawer. As you know, the big problem in psychology is the file drawer. Well, not just psychology, any, any field, really, where people may not report findings that are not significant. So we tried to adjust for it, although this is not perfect. The file drawer, uh, the trim and fill method has been criticized for not sufficiently adjusting for the file drawer. Um, if you do a Bayesian analysis instead of, uh, instead of a regular meta-analysis, um, you still get an effect. We did a P-curve analysis that came out consistent with evidential value, which was reassuring. Uh, the one time that the meta-analytic eff meta effect is not significant is when you apply this other adjustment method called PTPs. Um, then the effect is not, no, no longer significant. On the other hand, if the trim and fill method underestimates the file drawer, a lot of people think that the PTPs overestimates the file drawer in the sense of like, basically you take any small to moderate effect in psychology, if you apply the PTPs, you get nothing. So it's a bit unclear if how much we should put weight on this. So these are the issues of meta-analysis. You, you know, there are always different ways of interpreting meta-analysis. So then we went back to the, our original question, which was, um, can we um, reproduce any, these effects in a way that are reliable, because a lot of the implicit priming literature is, you know, has been now under scrutiny, as and and people are getting mixed results in terms of replicating these effects, uh, and oftentimes they don't replicate. So one uh, notable high-powered replication failure of religious priming was Gomez and McCullough, and here I'm showing you the their their result in relation to other results, other studies that have found. Um, and this is only, these are, this is uniquely dictator games. So these are religious priming effects on dictator games. So um, we have six studies. And uh, this is Gomez and McCullough at the end of the, um, the last one over there, where, that, where I have the arrow. But they, they didn't replicate, and they had a large sample size, much larger than, than the original studies. So when we saw this replication failure, of course, there was, we were concerned. Uh, and one thing that jumped at us was the fact that their control gr group was quite high in their offers. So in every other study that we know of where you get, you get this effect, you start with a selfish baseline. And we kind of, in our back of our minds, we always assume that the effect is basically what, what it's doing. This, the religious reminders are basically suppressing selfishness. They're, so you have to start from a selfish baseline to get the effect. Speaking of um, moderators and context. But in this case, their, their baseline was already almost approaching fairness. People were already splitting the, 
um, the, the, the endowment in half. So one way to look at this, I mean, it, one, one interpretation is that this is a false positive, and another interpretation is that, well, if, if you start with the, uh, basically people splitting the money in a fair way, you're not gonna, there's no room to go up. Uh, people are not, typically in dictator games are not, um, at least in our culture, in North America, they don't uh, go beyond 50-50 split in the dictator game. Cross-culturally they do, but not here. So, uh, so we, now we have three studies where we, we, we wanted to disentangle, that, and all, the hypotheses have all been pre-registered, the large sample sizes. In fact, the design we came up with this is a new, these are new studies, by the way. It hasn't been published yet, so I'm just showing to you. Um, haven't, not too many people have seen it. Um, we want to disentangle all the problems with implicit priming with the hypothesis, which is not really about implicit priming. It's about, is it the case that when people think about immoralizing God, they be, uh, then they're more likely to be prosocial with a stranger? Okay, that's the question. Um, so we came up with a, with a we adopted a, an approach that was previously published by um, Jeremy Ginges, Scott Atron, and, and their colleagues, uh, where they, they basically asked people, think about uh, God, and then they gave them moral dilemmas. Or they, they, or they had people uh, answer the moral dilemmas from their own perspective or from God's perspective. That's what they did. So in, the, in our case, um, we basically told people, think about what God wants you to do in this situation, and then people play the dictator games. We also added the karma condition, because we're also interested in whether or not karma can operate in similar ways as belief in moralizing gods. And um, we also looked at the effect of uh, the baseline of a participant? Is the participant starting with a selfish baseline or a, or a baseline that approaches fairness? One, uh, one nice advantage of this approach is also, I think, can be, can be run across cultures. Uh, it's, it's adaptable, although we haven't, beyond looking at Hindus, Buddhists, and Christians, we haven't looked at other cultures yet. Okay. So these are the, this is the, the team that has been working on this question. I'm just tagging along. So what we did is actually we had people play six dictator games in these studies. Because we also get, we wanted to get a, a better estimation of, of, of the outcome measure. Because one of the problems with the dictator game that it's widely used, it's very adaptable, but it's just one data point, right? So uh, we want to get more data points per subject as in, ter in terms of the dependent measure. So here's how, how it works. It's actually within subjects design, so it gives, you, it gives us a, a pretty good statistical power. All subjects starts with a neutral instructions where people are given um, um, uh, a certain amount to play with, and then they're asked to uh, basically a classic one-shot dictator game. They can keep the money, they can share the money um, how much they, as much as they like and then that's the end of the game. And they play it again with a different participant, and then a third time with, with a third participant. We varied the amount to see if that matters. In the end, it didn't matter. Um, participants were uh, then told, um, at the end of the experiment, you r we randomly pick one of the three trials in each round, and then you actually get paid for that amount. The reason we did that is because we, were, we didn't w want people to be strategic, okay? So they don't know which one they're going to get paid, but they're going to get paid for one of the, one of the trials. Then once they, people did round one, uh, before round two, they were given new instructions. So in, depending on their condition, it, it was either neutral instructions, just like before, or they were asked to think about how to play this game the way that they think their God wants that, them to play, or the way they think they, that karma wants them to play. We selected pre-selected participants based on their belief in God or their belief in karma in this study. And this was an empty sample. We had large sample sizes. These are the um, their distribution of their beliefs across, in, across conditions. 
and here are the results. In the neutral condition, this is uh, just the, the control condition, basically. Does it matter if people play this game repeatedly? Do they change? It doesn't look like they change. There's no effect of just playing the game repeatedly. Okay, this is, this is good because then the, the, this rules out the, the explanation that people are becoming more generous over time just because of order. It, that's not true. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to happen. This is the uh, God framing instructions. So before you make these decisions, please think about God. Make your decisions based on what your belief in God would lead you to do. These are believers. These were selected to be believers. So what we found was you get an effect. So uh, people become more generous when they think about God in this way. Karma, same thing. So the karma instructions were before you make these decisions, please think about karma. Make your decisions based on what your belief in the law of karma would lead you to do. Again, people are moving from uh, more selfishness to more, more fairness. As you can see, people are rarely ever uh, ultra-social. They're basically switching from uh, selfishness to fairness. In fact, we tested that, I, that so here's the mean givings, if you, you want to look at just the mean averages. So playing the game over and over again, neutral, neutral instructions, that doesn't make a difference. But when once people, you ask people to think about God, they become more pro-social, more generous. Karma, same effect, same effect size too. So believers of God, believers of karma, same effect. Now, is it the case that, uh, as we were sus suspecting, you get, you get this effect if you're starting from a selfish baseline, but if you're already starting from a, from a fair baseline, doesn't look, you know, our hypothesis was, uh, religious thinking is not going to make people who are already fair, not going to make them ultra-social. And that was indeed the case. So there was a correlation between pretest givings and, and the, basically the, whether or not people showed the effect. So the, ev the evidence is consistent with the idea that uh, the people who are showing the effect are the ones who are, were initially selfish. But it, the, basically the effect was zero for people who were already fair. We replicated this effect in a second study. Instead of pre-selecting people on being a believer of karma or God, we pre-selected people based on whether or not they were Christian, or they were Hindu, or they were Buddhist. So the Christian sample got the God instructions, as before. The Hindu and Buddhist samples were, got the karma instructions, and we replicated the effect. So um, believers of karma, when they were reminded of karma, in the, sorry, Buddhists and uh, Hindus, when they were reminded of karma, they, the generosity went up. Christians, when they were reminded of God, generosity went up. Uh, and this effect was moderated by initial offers. So, so self, selfish players showed the effect. Um, fair players didn't show the effect. We also uh, ran a third study. In this case, we compared believers to non-believers. So it was an interesting question whether or not non-believers would show the effect. Remember, in the meta-analysis, there was no effect of non-believers. Non and in this one study, uh, we also found that non-believers did not show the effect, except for believers of karma, where there was a, uh, sorry, non-believers of karma showed a small effect of, of, of instructions about karma. Okay. Um, I just want to, uh, so I'm going to move on now to, 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 uh, to um, the question of conflict and, and, uh, the dark side of religious cooperation. So it's something that I, I'm very interested in, although we don't have a lot of data on this, and it's a remarkably hard thing to study. Um, but given you know the world we live in, I think this is very important. So my hypothesis is that religious cooperation is not indiscriminate. It's not that, you know, that, that there's going to be boundaries, and uh, people are going to be strategic about who to cooperate with and not to cooperate with. It's not uh, it's not indiscriminate cooperation. Although, as I said. There are some interesting arguments for why, in some conditions, in some traditions, um, cooperation with strangers who are not part of your religious in-group or yet could be strategically uh, uh, would be, could be favored by cultural evolution. And for example, the potential for um, conversion might be one of those, but there could be other ones too. Another thing that I, I, that's interesting and, impo and important point is that. Um, Belief in moralizing gods actually strongly correlates with uh, the maintain maintenance of social hierarchies. So there could be other interesting effects going on here where these, these beliefs are not just uh, 
contributing to large-scale cooperation, but they might be also maintaining certain kinds of social hierarchies. So in the ethnographic record, these things are correlated. And finally, the other uh, important question is the question of secularization. That's something that's been on my mind recently. And this is the question of why and how is it that some societies have been uh, basically kicking the ladder of religion uh, and others aren't? So I was having uh, conversations earlier with, uh, about, about this with uh, some people. Um, so for example, it's really interesting that Europe has been secularizing rapidly uh, and has been secularizing rapidly in the last 100 years. But there's no evidence of secularization at all in places like Africa or Latin America. Um, so there are some interesting things to think about here. One, one effect, uh, one strong um, predictor of secularization is wealth, in particular um, wealth that's distributed relatively evenly. So uh, this is one slide you can, uh, there are so many slides like this, so many studies like this that show that as societies become wealthier, uh, religion declines. Uh, so this is just per capita GDP, uh, but if you plot, say, the Human Development Index, you get the same general pattern. Um, so as countries are becoming more, uh, more uh, wealthier, um, they're becoming less religious. There are some interesting outliers, like the United States. It's a whole other question. Um, but uh, there's a strong pattern here. If you add inequality, like the Gini index, you, you can explain even more variance on this. So, com so it's not just wealth, but also, uh, basically, this, this is consistent with the idea of, uh, from Engelhardt and Norris, the idea of existential security. In places where there is more existential security, where life is predictable, uh, people can lean on, on, on others or on the state for uh, safety and, and control in times of, in difficult times, these places, this is the places where religion is declining the most. Now this might lead you to assume that as the world is becoming wealthier and more um, egalitarian, then the religion should decline, but that's not really true because there are other things going on. So one other powerful counter trend to the secularization trend where people are opt opting out of religion is fertility rates. So religion has a very strong effect on fertility which means that uh, whatever religions are losing in terms of membership, they might be gaining back from, um, from just the fact that in societies where religion is important, people are having more children. And in societies that are secularized, people are not even reproducing at replacement levels. So it becomes very complicated to project what's going on with religion in the world, which is an interesting question. And uh, the closest projections that I've seen uh, say that the proportion of religion, religiosity in the world is not going to change that much in the next coming decades. Uh, the world is still mostly religious and it's, re it's going to remain religious. But that masks a lot of regional variability on this, as I said earlier. So it's an interesting question. So I'll stop here. And uh, this is my uh, feeble attempt at, at uh, doing field work. This is, uh, this is just, uh, this was in Nepal a number of years ago where I had a very interesting uh, travels in the Himalayas, uh, learning about a little, little bit, learning a little bit about um, Nepal, Nepalese uh, culture and religion, which is very different from what I was used to growing up in Lebanon, where, you know, in the Abrahamic tradition. Um, and I want to uh, emphasize that the kind, this kind of work is impossible to do. It's really hard to do without collaboration. Um, so you need methodological pluralism. So you need different kind of skill sets to bring together to be able to test ideas like this, I think, uh, which means interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research is very important. So this is the tale of the uh, elephant and the ten blind men, right? The idea that you know, religion is a little bit like the elephant. So if you only have one methodological uh, approach in one discipline, you may see the trunk you may see the, uh, of the elephant, you might see the skin of the elephant in, from a different perspective, but you need, you're not going to be able to put everything together, right? Is a blind, the, the blind man trying to approach one thing from one perspective, a complex thing from one perspective. So you have to then have these people talk together so that they can put the pieces of the puzzle together. So that's sort of really, I think, what I've learned from the, all, this, all this collaboration. And I want to thank uh, 
many of our former students, current former students and collaborators for, for this work. Thank you. Alan. Well, beautiful, beautiful talk and, and uh, some great, great data and uh, really interesting studies. Um, in terms of, for, for many people, religion and morality really are coterminous in the sense that they perceive, if you say what's moral, it's well, whatever God wants, right? Or whatever the holy books ordain, right? So is it religion per se, or is it morality? So if, 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 if so you can prime religion you know, as God or karma. But supposing you simply prime right and wrong. So if you say, uh, think about you know, what moral philosophers, or think about what, you know, think about what's right and wrong, would you get exactly the same effect that you get for priming for religion? Um, so, okay. Uh, so, to go back to your first point, the fact that so for some people religion and morality are coextensive or at least overlapping is part of what we're trying to find out about. And part of our reasoning is that that's not how religion started. So, the, and you find in many places in the world, for example, among foragers, where that's not the case. So, you know, we had Korn Abicella who collected data among the Hadza. For the Hadza, you know, they have, they have belief in Haine and Ishoko, they're two gods, they have ancestor spirits, but they don't really think that these gods or the ancestor spirits care about morality at all, Nothing. right? So that's part of our point, that this convergence happened over historical time and it's a cultural evolutionary process. Yeah. It's not inherent in religious beliefs. No. And so, from a cognitive byproduct perspective, that's what you would expect. Uh, that once, first you have to have religious beliefs and intuitions to begin with, before that those those intuitions could produce cultural variants that are consistent with this idea. In contrast to the supernatural punishment hypothesis, which says that part of these intuitions is that, you know, if you think about it, your ancestors' spirits, part of you, what you're doing is thinking about the fact that they're they're going to punish you if you if you violate norms. So that's that's a different approach. Uh, if do you do you, will you get these effects if you prime people with morality? I, I haven't done it, but I would, I would, you know, I would agree with you. I think that you probably would get these kinds of effects. If you ask people before they play a dictator game, think about your moral values and then play a game, something like that. Yeah. I don't know, if, has anyone done that? I don't know. I mean, part but of the problem uh, is if you mix up demand and, and priming per se, right? <clears throat> so, um, okay. so. I didn't mention about the, uh, our attempt to deal with the demand, external demand question. So one, and we worried about that. So is it the case that what's going on in these experiments, people, you know, we ask them people if they think about God and, or karma and how, you know, and play this game according to what, what your thoughts are about, about God or karma. People might think, well, I don't, I, I don't think that God wants me to be pro-social, but I think the experimenter wants me to think that, therefore I do that. So, so we were worried about that. And uh, one thing we did is we actually asked people at the end of the experiment to tell us what they thought about the experiment. We asked them, do you think what the experimenter was trying to find out? So we got extensive, uh, we had a questionnaire where we got these measures and then we <coughs> actually measured how much, to the extent to which people were able to predict the hypothesis. So the, the, ex the experiment demand hypothesis says that people, people can do this only if they can. They know what the hypothesis is, right? You can't be. You can't do what the experimenter wants you to do unless you know what the experimenter wants. Unless you guess the hypothesis. No, you need to know the prediction, but not the hypothesis. Yeah, the prediction. It's yeah. Not the same thing. The hypothesis is the explanation. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't mean like the theoretical explanation. I meant like, you know, something. Like, did people say something like, "I think the experimenter is trying to see if I, I'm going to give more money if because I'm thinking about God." something like that, right? So we coded for these kinds of responses. Um, in fact, we did a gradation, like, you know, how, how close you got to this kind of, you know, prediction. Um, and we controlled for it. In t so we had three experiments. In two of the three experiments, there was an effect of this variable on, on, the, um, on, on giving. 
although it was small. In the, in the other one experiment, there was no effect. Controlling for the effect didn't change the R effect. So, the and there was no interaction. Part of the problem is that if you're smart enough to think about what the experimenter wanted, you may know enough about psychology to know that you should say that you didn't know what the prediction was. <laughs> that's what the experimenter also wants you to say. Yeah, <laughs> well, OK. No, I mean, I, I admire the fact yeah, no, that you no, did yeah, no, no, this is, this, this, I mean, this is something that continues to worry me. So I, you know, we need yeah. to, part of my, so here, the, the couple of other things that is, reassures me that it's not just experimental demand that's going on. The experimental demand hypothesis shouldn't be specific to, to for example, sh does not predict that uh, the effect should only work for people who are starting with a selfish baseline. Why, why not? If you're already giving, you know, if you're being fair and you're just driven by experimental demand, why not, why not be even more prosocial, right? We, we didn't find that. Um, Non-believers didn't show the effect. Why not? If you're, ex you're just driven by experimental de demand, you don't, you're not a believer, you don't believe in this, but you think, oh, this is what the experimenter wants me to do, then well, you just the do it. The so we're not getting that. Yeah, it's wonderful that you did the debriefing and that you looked to see if it had an effect. But there you've gone way beyond what most people have to but do. But if you can think of any other way to, part of the, what's so tricky about experimental demand explanations is that it's, un, it's not usually easy to tell how you can test it. But if you can think of other ways of testing that, that alternative, I, I'm, I'm very you know, eager to hear that. Over there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm pretty sure you've done this, but I just wanted to double check. So instead of saying God or karma, what about just like an influential other who can impose costs? Yeah. Like mom. We haven't done that yet, or but that's something that <laughs> What would mom want you to do in this yeah. scenario? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I, we've been thinking about what would be the I, I, ideal way of asking that question, yeah. where it's some other source of morality. So you think mother would be the work? I don't know. It's just what popped in my head. We thought about maybe like something like society, uh, asking people like it's kind of vague though. Yeah. But yeah, and that's a great of, question. Yeah. Um, we're we're we're, we're yeah. definitely open to these ideas. So, what else can we well, ask people? Oh well, I was just gonna say the only problem with society is people kind of personify it in some yeah. ways. You may accidentally. I think I also noticed this with the karma thing. You said, "What would karma want you to do?" So, right? I think so. No, we didn't say no, that. No, no, no. We we were because we were worried about you know Mental not personifying states. karma oh, okay. for the participants. Yeah, although okay. many participants well, do personify karma that. in our uh, and right. other results we found. So the karma instructions were a bit more um, um, less less leading. Okay. Let me see if I can find it here. Before you make these decisions, please think about karma. Make your decision based on what your belief in the law of karma would lead you to. So it's not personifying it. Okay. Mm. But that's just kind of saying, like, you believe this. Yeah. What are you going to do? With it? Right. Yeah. 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 So it's, I mean, we started here because we thought like, this is like the strongest way to test this. Right? We thought if we don't get effects here, I would really worry. You know, I would be like, maybe there, you know, all of these other previous stuff were false positives. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely, you know, now that we have these effects, we, there's lots of interesting questions you can ask. You know, you make it more subtle, make it more implicit, mm -hmm. to figure out what's going on with, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but without doing this, what, was, what we were struggling with was, you know, when we don't replicate these effects, and in our own lab, we, sometimes we haven't replicated the implicit priming effects. Is it because of the implicit priming is just finicky, or is it that the hypothesis is wrong? You know, yeah. it's hard to tell. Yeah. So this was like the most overt way of mm -hmm. doing it, so that yeah. we can start somewhere that's more solid. Mm -hmm. then. So, um, demand characteristics are a subset of a larger category, which is impression management. And, um, not necessarily. Well, there are other accounts of demand characteristics that, that, that say it's just about pragmatics of conversation. It's not that peop, the persons that want to impress the experimenter. It's just more like, I'm just having a conversation here. I will, will want to understand what the experimenter thinks I should well, be doing that's, or wants to do. Yeah, that's one way of putting it, but another way would be to say um, that you care about the pragmatics of the interaction. Yes, that you care about the assessment of the other groups. Yeah, so it's not about pleasing the experimenter in that explanation. It's about being a good conversationalist. 
Right, but where I'm going with this is that um, uh, it's conceivable that, so the way that in, in some of us working on related topics here think about it is that in any experiment there are potentially two frames of interaction. And one is the frame within the experiment, so in this case, you know, for example, in the dictator game, the interaction between the participant and the anonymous recipient of the participant's largesse, right? And then there's an, a frame of the outer interaction, which, which is the participant and the experiment. And the participant's actions within the inner frame are, even when the participants are assured of anonymity and when you introduce double-blind methods to try and reassure people in this, nonetheless, participants, I think, are always thinking about the outer frame to a certain extent. And for example, if, you know, so I'm, I'm a member of a minority religion um, in uh, a, a region where there is you know, a lot of contested space among these mm -hmm. religions. And this powerful researcher who clearly has money to burn because they're giving it away comes to my community, right? It seems impossible for me as a participant to not be thinking about the outer frame. And when that experimenter then says, now I want you to think about your religion, right? That just underscores for me how much this interaction is really about the outer frame, right? So I think it's easy for us to sit on the couch and say, oh, well, you know, here's what we should have done or what we could have done. But I think you have to take very seriously the possibility that, um, that your attempts to direct people's cognition to their belief systems are having other effects with regard to the social interaction. Right? And it, it's clear that, that, that even devout individuals, that their attention must not always be on their belief system, because if they really believed in an omniscient, omnipotent, and, 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 and moralistic God, they would never sin, right? That right. is, they would never violate the tenets of their own um, uh, 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 right. moral code. And yet people clearly do. So clearly they must be thinking that you know, God isn't watching, or they're not thinking about God right now, or whatever it is. Yeah. So the logic of your experiment is fine. I just am concerned that that there's an entirely alternative explanation, which is that what you're really doing is leading participants to think about their identity as as believers relative to the experiment. Or can I can I chime in here? I mean, it, it's not just identity. The question is, do they follow your instructions? Because if they follow your instructions, well, then they would be fair. It's not, I mean, to call this priming is a kind of funny thing. Because yeah, and I know, that's why, I, actually, I didn't call it priming. Did I call it priming? We were hesitant to call this priming because I don't know if this would qualify as priming. It's, you know, like we're priming quite a word. priming is somebody in a mindset, but this is actually, that you've given them instruction to say, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, part of what we were doing is, and I recognize all these issues, like, and I think we need to flesh it out. We need a lot more data to be, to be more confident about, you know, about, about these effects. But part of what we were doing is to sidestep the, the methodological issues of priming and test the hypothesis in a different way that, so that, we, we, you know, so that we, we, we know that it's not about, you know, it's not a methodological issue, it's, 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 it's something else, right? But, but so it is instructions, we're giving instructions to people. Any instructions that you gave them here? In other words, if you said, divide evenly, well, and they would divide evenly. If you said, keep it all for yourself, well, they would keep it all for themselves. In other words, what you're testing is just, are they following your instructions? Yeah, but why would, I mean, we're following instructions, we think, just think about karma. We're not telling people to do anything else, right? But they but they think that thinking about karma means I should be more fair. Yeah. But is that, does, if you understand what karma is, it's to be, to be, you know, to be good. Well, uh, if, that's true. I mean, be, be non-believers of karma also understand what karma is. Yeah. Well, then you had an effect on the non-believers. It was a much smaller effect. Non-believers of God didn't sh actually went the opposite. So in a non in the in study where we had believers and non-believers, for the God condition, there was a small effect in the opposite direction for non-believers. So there was almost like some kind of a reactance. So that's not consistent with the idea that they're just it's just the effect of understanding the instructions. Yeah, it is consistent with an outer frame effect, though. So, so say more? So, uh, I'm an atheist. You yeah. come to me and say, yeah. think about what Christianity would 
tell you given the situation, and I say, I'm now going to signal to you how much mm -hmm. I'm an atheist by doing the opposite. <laughs> So what, so what do you think then of the, the findings that we're getting that, um, that the effect is not, there's no effect for people who are starting with, a, with a approaching a fair baseline? So why are these people? These people have multiple directives. So one of them is, you know, don't screw other people over. And that's true whether they are religious or not. And if they're at the fair offer, right, um, then they kind of maxed out on where there is the opportunity to not screw other people over. None of these, I mean, it, you could flip that around, that finding, and, and, and have it be a cause for skepticism, because if, if the if cultural evolution favors um, hyper-generosity toward in-group members, right, then you should expect hyper-fair offers with your manipulation, whether you want to call it funding or not, and you're not funding. So that might be cause for skepticism. Wait, what, why would you expect hyper-fair? So, because cultural evolution should favor self-sacrificial behavior towards the in-group, groups that successfully promote that. I mean, this is, you know, throw yourself on a grenade, go blow yourself up in the face of the enemy. Groups that mm -hmm. successfully promote self-sacrificial behavior will outcompete groups that don't. Under some conditions, not always. Well, yeah. you're positing a situation in which there is intense competition between the major religions, and that's what has led to their scale. Well, over history, not in this experiment. True, but you would expect that... So the, it's possible, for example, that in, if you go to his cultural context where there's, I mean, I don't think the average empirical is experiencing intense religious competition, but I would be with you in, in some places where there is intense competition. Okay, well, that's an experiment. In which case, one could ex you know, make this kind of thing. I would expect, I, you're right, I would expect the, the more intense the inter interreligious competition is, the more you should get effects on in group um, altruism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so these these experiments you described, you have used dictator games and ultimatum games. Have any been any experiments connecting religious belief or religious priming to behavior and trust games? Because it seems to me like one of the things that religion yeah. these kinds of religions do, they don't just say be generous to others, yeah. they say yeah. trust, trust, especially yeah. trust others of your own religion. There is not a huge amount on that, but I know of one study <clears throat> that looked at it was done in Germany and looked at, they, people played the trust game, and they were either religious or non-religious, playing with religious or non-religious people, and you got that, you, you would get the, what you'd expect. So, believers trusted believers more, as a result transferred money more, and as a result they got money more. Uh, non-believers, it was symmetrical, so non-believers did not trust non-believers more. They were indifferent. Okay. But believers were systematically biased towards trusting believers. It's one study though, so, you know, I'd like to see more applications of that kind of thing to, you know, to be more confident. Thank but yeah, it's an interesting, definitely interesting area to look at. Related to this question, uh, are the studies in which believers are shown to uh, punish people morally, punish people who transgress on moral norms more than non-believers? So when, when, the, when punishing comes at a cost, Punishing uh, norm violators? Yeah, exactly. At, at, at a cost to the person who's punished. So it, it, within the context of your design, it would be a third party punishment. Yeah, yeah. There have been some studies of third party punishment, and you get this crowding out effect. So um, if you think someone else will punish the, a wrongdoer or norm violator, then that seems to cut out the effect of religion, in, at least in a couple of studies I know if that's what you're asking. So in Joe Henrik's study from 2010, where they had different cultures play the dictator game, ultimate game, and then the third game was third party punishment game. And they got effects of world religion on dictator game and ultimatum game, but no effect of religion on punishment, the third party punishment game. So if you think that someone's gonna be punished anyway, you're like, I, then you know, you, there's not, no, there's not as much need for religion to do the job, something like that. Does that help? So, there's, and that also raises the interesting question of um, how secular institutions interact with religion, right? So things get complicated. So if you have secular modes of enforcing cooperation, you don't, so there's not as much, religion becomes less of a area of, of, of um, 
or less of a source of cooperation. It is almost this compensatory relationship. Then. So I have a question, just a more trivial, methodological question about the non-random allocation game, which is the aptness of this for what you're trying to test. Because yeah, it, it, you're you're testing, you're you're pitting two moral norms against each other, right? Um, you're you're pitting um, uh, yeah within yeah co-religionist uh, altruism against honesty, right? Because um, yeah. People you think of it that essentially way. have to be deceiving either you or themselves or both at some level in order to produce the the you know the the, the within group favoritism result. And you know, if you want to promote cooperation within the in group, um, honesty is an important norm, right? So, um, are are you actually diluting the effect that you're trying to find here? So, I mean, find an effect, but would you find a stronger effect? if you didn't pick one moral norm against the other? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is it not the case that honesty... Uh, sorry, go ahead. Is it not the case that honesty in that situation... I mean, it's... it's the experiment should not be the, um, the... you know, the beneficiary, I guess, of the honesty. I mean, yeah. honesty within the in-group is certainly desirable, but I think people in the experiment, so, if they're going to favor their co-religionists, then... The participant, the participant is instructed to create a rule and then follow the rule, right? Right. And if the allocations aren't approximately even, then it must be the case that either they're not following the rule or they're not creating the rule. So, you know, if they're not following the rule, then they're just not being adherent to whatever you want yeah. to call it. We were science. pretty sure that they were following the rule. We went at great lengths to make sure that they were following the rules and not include part, the few participants who clearly we could see they weren't following the rules. So we're pretty confident that people were following the rule. Following or formulating? Uh, the rule being basically, you know, if the die comes this color, you put the, uh, you know, the coin in this cup, because the other opposite color, different color, you put in another cup. So it was pretty straightforward. They had to mentally make that rule, so we, we couldn't tell. That, that's why it was anonymous, right? So unless they they can read minds or they can predict uh, you know the future, they would you would expect probabilities which says that they should be you know evenly distributed over a large number of trials, right? It's interesting because we were thinking of, of this issue in a different way. Like our worry was that um, because of uh, norms for being honest, we basically like. Ties that tied our, our, ourselves up, right? So yeah, that's my point. You're we good. actually got the very, uh, you know, like the deviation from from norm following in this game was not huge. We did find enough so that we can look for this effect, but it was much smaller than we expected. So that gives us a narrow window to to work with. So you're saying if we didn't, if you devise a different game where you don't have this strong norm to, to for honesty, you might you might have more spread and you might have a bigger effect. Yeah, and, and there's there's also an interesting question here is like by favoring co-religionists or actually it's not like people were favoring co-religionists, they were favoring the self less and they were favoring the in group co-religionists less. So the effect was the overall effect was People favor themselves more, and they favor their in-group in more, their community more. But that effect got reduced quite a bit um, for people who, were, who believed in, you know, in the moralizing and punishing gods. So, yeah. Alan? Well, I've talked too much, but, uh, but if, if there's anybody... Um, I want to go take, you know, I want to look at the big picture here. Okay. I'm very sympathetic and interested with your idea. I'm very interested in it. But I've also studied at great length uh, a, a religion without a high God. Yeah, yeah. So my, That's where I did my field work in Burkina Faso, the Morsi, yeah. there's a high God in a very, in a strict sense, but very odious, doesn't really care about people and doesn't really have anything yeah. to do with people, really. And yeah, I mean, so really it isn't practical purposes, he's not there. He's not punishing people, anyway. Right. 
Um, so I think can I just I want to clarify uh, something that you know in our the way we conceptualize things, you know, because there's high God variable in the ethnographic record, yeah. like in the in human religion enterprise. What we're talking about is not the idea of a high God that's like a creator God and then doesn't care about yeah. anything. That's not our interest. Yeah. Although sometimes uh, we we're forced to use the, that variable because that's all, that's how anthropologists have defined it in the past. Yeah. Yeah. But we're talking about omniscience, punishing, and moralizing, yeah. not not okay. creator. So God. The, the Mossy have a God, but he's just only yeah. they say he doesn't really get involved right. in human affairs. And I think that the the Mossy religion, from what I've read about other traditional non-world religions, is you know moderately typical. Okay. Um, they believe that when you do certain things wrong, there's an imminent sanction, not carried out by any agent. It just, you violate certain taboos, bang, you die. Or, interestingly enough, my cousins die, or my children, or my brothers, right? So yeah. it, could, it could fall not on me, but on people that I care about, presumably. Um, so there's no punishing deity, but the norms punish themselves. And they are really quite concerned about this. This isn't a theoretical belief. This is something that divination constantly shows that you are sick or dying or your children have died because you violated some taboo. They don't think that anybody punished you. They think that when you commit adultery, you know, or when you do this or that, your children die or you or you die or your brothers die or something. Um, they, now there's another set of beliefs that is not, you know, whether you call it religion or not is an interesting question of definition. But they believe in supernatural, non-material processes by which, if you, if other people are envious of you, oh, right. they will kill you. Not by any material means, but yeah. by their envy. Yeah. So if other, or if it depends on the beliefs and things, but, but that other people can, witches basically. Yeah. And there are different kinds of witch beliefs, but that merely somebody hating you will cause yeah. your death. Yeah. And there's no God involved there. Yeah. But the result is that if you if people are pissed off at you, it might be fatal. So I think that this is a pretty common belief system, and and I really want to stress that it's not like people believe this in principle. They 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 see it verified, you know, every month through de deaths that are then interpreted as, uh, you know, by offici officially interpreted and believed to be the result of these processes. So they, they, they consult oracles and diviners, they actually consult the dead person <laughs> and, and, you know, find out and so forth. So that it's not like these are just ideas, these are fears, everyday anxieties. And they enforce norms. Mm -hmm. They enforce, you don't want to get somebody pissed off at you if their mere hatred of you could cause your death. And you don't want to, buy, you don't want to violate these taboos about adultery or <coughs> whatever it is because they will cause you to die intrinsically without any agency involved. There's nobody doing it. It just happens. So why do you need the high gods? So... Um, why do you need punitive gods if... Yeah, so, so I mean, so... It sounds like you're talking about something like <coughs> justice beliefs. So karma is a culture, one cultural elaboration of that, right? So it's possible that there is widespread norms in many places that that are based on this kind of imminent justice. So uh, intuitions, uh, witchcraft is possibly you know a part of that. Um, you know, where I grew up in the Middle East, you know, people believe in the evil eye. Although it doesn't seem to me that the, something like witchcraft or evil eye beliefs don't seem to be about, it could, they seem to be much more capricious. So, for example, in the, in the evil eye belief, people often don't advertise their successes because um, you attract the evil eye, you attract envy, and then people can punish you. Not because you did something wrong, you know, just because you're well, just successful. But it may be wrong to. to collect resources and fail to share them. Well, people have a lot of beliefs about things like having a beautiful, healthy child, you know. Because people are envious of you who don't. Yeah. So, I, to me, that seems to be qu quite that's, a, that's part of a larger different. picture of don't, don't be better off than anybody else. Yeah. And that means you can't share your child, but you can share everything else, you know. 
Uh, all I know is that, that in this culture, and I think from what I've read, very widely true, that people believe in imminent, uh, they believe in imminent sanctions for certain kinds of transgressions, and they believe in witches who, and, and sorcerers, various other mechanisms by which somebody who's who, who is whose feelings are hurt, or you know, feels like you weren't nice to them, or you're not sharing, you're not being kind, will kill you. I mean, I, I remember a couple of years ago reading uh, something in the Economist about this, you know, Liberia, where people seem they were almost like people were paralyzed by witchcraft beliefs. So it's interesting because you can get cultural equilibria like that where it's completely dysfunctional for people, but you know, you can stabilize. But it can be under dysfunctional some in terms of personal well-being to believe that anybody around you could kill you, and probably some people are, but it does make you behave yourself very well. Yeah, so I mean, my short answer to you is a very good question, but the short version of my answer is that there could be many different ways to stabilize uh, different scales of cooperation. Um, but, but your so account of why like, the world religions have... Uh, well, I think this is a pretty good one that has worked over, you know, millennia and across many places. doesn't mean there, are not, there aren't any other ways to do it. But, if, but if, if your account is an account trying to explain the spread of the world religions, and I'm not sure if that's what it is an account of... That's partly an account of that. If yeah. you're trying to say why are there these world religions because they, the world religions all have a punitive God, if they're replacing other systems in which the plenty of punishment is just not being administered by, by the God, why why would that work? You mean in comparison to say um, witchcraft or? Well, supposing the people that justice? I worked with, who when I was there long ago, you know, they were one percent Christian. Suppose they all became Christian. Yeah. Well, they still now they have a God punishing the transgressions, but before they had plenty of punishment. Uh, or whatever you want to call it, they thought you would die if you violated the norms. Now God's punishing you. One, one possible explanation, I'm sympathetic to your concern, but one possible explanation is that while um, those kinds of belief systems can promote within group cooperation, and I think Ara alluded to this, um, they are much less constrained in the scope of behaviors that they can shape because they don't have a moral center to them, right? So there are all kinds of taboos that are, that are where people, you know, firmly and, and, and um, sincerely believe that violation of those taboos will have all kinds of serious detrimental consequences. And the taboos are arbitrary. They don't promote group welfare. They don't promote cooperation. Um, I, disagree. Uh, you know. I disagree about that. I think most of the taboos that, that the, at least the people that I work with and the other cultures that I worked with, there are taboos that seem arbitrary, but, but many, most of them are really about violating norms of some kind of specific kinds of norms, a subset of norms. Um, and, cer and certainly the beliefs in which and witchcraft and sorcery are that if, 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 if I offend you, you'll kill me. I mean, that's one cause for people to ensource the letters. Another is because they're irascible, right? Hmm? And another reason that people ensource all others in the belief systems is that they're just irascible. That, that guy's just an angry character. Right? Well, but you may be a real unreasonable guy. But if I piss you off, if I think that if I piss you off, I'll kill you, I'm going to be really nice to you no matter how unreasonable you are. But a, a, a better system for promoting cooperation is to contain the irascible individual and not to placate them. Right? They're a detrimental force in cooperation. Well, how, does, how, does, how, does, how does Allah or Yahweh do that any better than these other things? because they provide injunctions to people that, to shape the behavior of their neighbors. Right? Additionally, I, I contest, I think it's an empirical question that I don't think we're going to answer here, but I, I contest your claim that, you know, that the principal influence of taboo systems on behavior is to promote pro social behavior. I think there are an awful lot of very, very costly, you know, this is stable equilibrium where you get costly taboos that do nothing at all. And Liberia is an extreme case of the way that the system can generate. I think most food taboos are completely dysfunctional, and yet they are, you know, a near ubiquitous feature of human societies. So, it's an empirical question, I don't think we have the answer. Well, I don't, my argument doesn't depend on the question of what proportion of taboos are functional. It just says that if most or many norms are already thought to be <coughs> to cause violation of which is thought to cause horrible consequences without any God being involved. Um, 
And yeah. not only that, but when, when the world religions increasingly, this is a change over historical time, they don't say, oh, this person's got, you know, got cancer because God's punishing them. They say, well, God works in these mysterious ways. Yes, this poor innocent child has died. We can't understand why God, you know, this is moral, but in some mysterious way. But the, the most of whom I work with, and I take them as a prototype for certain purposes, they say, no, George died this, you know, today because of this. This child died, you know, last week because of this. So they actually make these attributions about particular but all suffering, actually, is attributed to moral transgression, essentially. 99% of it is. It's not about the world religions today, which sort of says, well, God will punish you, and you will suffer in the eternity, but actually not today, and maybe, you know, who knows, and we don't know why this person is suffering. So it seems like the, the, the non-punitive God systems have got, uh, they're scarier. They're, they're I'm, I'm not sure I agree, actually. So I think, you know, when you look at a schedule of reinforcement, when if you're uncertain when it's going to happen and how it's going to happen, but you may know that it probably will happen. If it's in the indefinite future, then the discounting just makes it all go away. So one, I think one one important question here is what norms are these beliefs stabilizing, right? So there there are all kinds of beliefs that stabilize local norms, but the question here is how can you get that's how we started, you know, the puzzle. Like, how do you get people to cooperate with complete strangers that they may or may not ever interact with again, right? So why would witchcraft beliefs do that? If they could do it, I would like to see the evidence that they could do it, right? Yeah, so well, I think that's part so that's, of the first thing. That's sort of part of the Enforce generic norms on generic, at least called religionists, which I think probably the, 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 most of the taboos that I'm talking about and most of the witchcraft beliefs stabilize cooperation within the community and with kin and so forth, um, <clears throat> but not so generically yeah. towards random strangers. I mean, there's another very interesting question that uh, sort of lurked in, in your question, uh, which is whether or not these, th there seems to be like a collection of cultural beliefs, you know, I don't know what you want to call them, imminent justice beliefs, you know, they, 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 tap, they seem to tap into some intuitions about this idea that moral transgressions can have, you know, these this supernatural effects on, you know, you, you die because you did something wrong or you get punished because of anything wrong. And we see in, in different cultures in different ways. And so the one question is, is that cultural evolution or is that some kind of innate evolved psychology, right? And, uh, or is it, is, or is it a combination word. of the two, right? You know, <laughs> cultural evolution can pick up on these intuitions from world psychology. We're all out of time, so we have to give Ari the last word on that. So, thank you. Thank you.